Wow. Okay, so our final panel of the event, and it's a topic actually that's relatively new to Aviadev Africa. Uh, I won't go into too much detail about the topic, but I will introduce your moderator for this panel. Sean Mendes has been an incredible supporter of Aviadev during his time when he served as COO of Africa World Airlines in Ghana. He's now an independent consultant. He's always on the TV giving his comment, and he's never afraid to share his opinions. Um, Sean's got an encyclopedic knowledge of the industry. I remember walking around the MRO in Ethiopian, and he, from the registration, he was telling me which routes that particular aircraft flew 20, you know, 10 years ago, whatever it may be. Uh, it, was, it was unbelievable. Um, and yeah, he's also had so much experience in Africa. He worked in airport management. He managed Mogadishu International Airport, obviously worked with Cargo Airline as well, and also with uh, Africa World Airlines. And he was involved in a national carrier in Ghana too. So he's got the full, um, it's like if you're in McDonald's and you get the stars, he's got them all, I think, you know? And believe it or not, he's still 21. So Sean, join us on stage. The floor is yours, my friend. Good. Uh, well, we're still morning, despite a bit behind schedule. Um, let me invite my panelists up on stage uh, to begin with, because, you know, after all, I may be the moderator, but uh, the entire panel is about what they have to say. So if I could uh, invite my panelists in the order that they are listed, Samir, Helen, Federico, Roger, and Joao, to come on in and take their seats, please. I'm going to run through a very quick introduction about the... Uh, the personalities of our uh, of our various panelists, and uh, you know, I'm not going to run through their CVs as much because you can probably pull that up on their LinkedIn or through the through the app, I'm sure. And uh, so I'm just going to just introduce them a bit in that way. And I'm going to start with Roger, who, as everyone here should know, if you don't, why don't you? Uh, is the CEO of Airlink, which is the most successful uh, regional carrier in South Africa for sure. And it's very interesting to see which seat Roger picked there because he's sitting in the middle. And that's something which he's not very used to because Roger, in fact, is one of the few airlines which has zero middle seats in its entire fleet. So uh, Roger's out there sitting in the middle, and uh, let's give him a hand and a welcome. <laughs> then the lovely lady who's brightening up our panel here is Helen. And uh, Helen's here from Afrex in Bang, based in Cairo, Egypt. And uh, you know, Helen's actually new to aviation, uh, but she has a long career so far in banking. Uh, she's been with two banks that unfortunately, well, went the way that many aviation companies do and uh, died and were merged. And that's with Merrill and Lehman, both. Uh, so I think that was a very good reason to try and come into aviation so she could bring that expertise further. But the most interesting thing about her, though, is that she's sitting right in the middle, and that's very good because she's perfectly ambidextrous. She can do everything with her both her right and her left hand. So give us a two-handed wave now. <laughs> <laughs> the next is Helen is Federico, and uh, he's an Italian, but he's an Italian who's moved to the cold of Lithuania, which has been a bit of a culture shock for him. For all they say about a united Europe, there is a lot of difference there. But his major skill is one that's going to make him very popular, not just in Lithuania, but with anywhere that he goes to a conference in the future, because it seems that his family has a secret magic pizza recipe. So if you're ever at a conference with Federico in the future, make sure you try and bring him a pizza oven and try and get him to make you a pizza. <laughs> Thank you. Down there in the far corner is Zuao. And uh, I could introduce him as the, you know, as the Director General of LAM Mozambique Airways, but instead I'm going to introduce him as the former Africa-wide junior badminton champion. <laughs> and uh, despite a, a, a promising sporting career, Joao, fortunately for all of us, went into airlines and technology. He worked many years with United Technology and Pratt and & Whitney. Uh, I'm sure he's been an account rep for you all if you were in that line uh, 20 years ago, give or take. And now, of course, he's running the national carrier in Mozambique. So that there is Joao. <laughs> and then last and not least uh, is the person who's come the longest way from anywhere in the world to attend this conference. And he's come all the way here from Canada, and that's Samir over here. Uh, he's here representing a lessor today, but he's got a career in, well, in pretty much everything. He was trying to list it to me, and I didn't have enough ink in my pen to take notes. Uh, but he's a former OEM, but most notably in his past CV, 
He is a former pilot of a company that offered mile-high flights over Niagara Falls. <laughs> so uh, that's a very interesting uh, niche in aviation. I don't quite think there is a conference for people uh, engaged in that industry. So he'll be the representative and talk a little bit about that here. There's one question in our panel of that. So that is the five people that are going to be sharing their views on airline financing uh, today. Um, like all the other panels so far, we have a poll to ask you guys uh, what your views are. And uh, this poll actually is going to cover a lot of the topics that we're going to talk about here as well. But interestingly, we're actually going to revisit this poll and have a little bit of chat of it uh, about it and what the results are uh, right as more as we come to the end. So, uh, you know, as you can have a look, what is the most critical financing issue facing African Airlines today? And, you know, I'll, I'll just give you a quick overview of the four choices. Um, number one is the lack of access to local capital at competitive rates. Uh, number two is the high ownership cost component due to the infrastructure constraints that limit your utility. You, you can't fly your planes around the clock in Africa because, well, there's load shedding. Uh, Number three is relatively low absolute demand, which makes revenue more vulnerable to fluctuations. Uh, you know, you can, you can lose 50% of your passengers pretty much overnight in Africa, and that could, be, that could be fatal because there's so many external shocks that happen in the system. And finally, number four, which is one that's close to Roger's heart, is anti-competitive activity by government players. Um, this is something which, you know, all of us have run private sector or government airlines in Africa you know, feel very strongly about one way or the other. And Roger and Joao are friends sitting next to each other. One's a government, one's a private sector. And, uh, you know, that would be a great one for them to spar over, friendly sparring. But when we were prepping for this, we've given you four alternatives. But Samir, who I'm going to start off with here, says there's actually a fifth one. So I'm going to throw the first thing out to Samir and go ahead and start and tell us more about the fifth alternative. Thanks, Sean. I guess, first of all, I have to say that my, uh, my CV was, you know, developing over the years. So I was looking at how I built up my flight experience by providing a quote-unquote essential service. I was just flying the airplane. That's all that matters, right? That's all. <laughs> um, no, I think really interesting question on the poll, and, and as we were discussing beforehand, I think one of the challenges here, or one of the key challenges, particularly on the continent, is, is there a sustainable strategy? to actually implement before you start accessing capital, selecting aircraft, uh, chasing routes. You know, does the, the strategy that comes out for that particular airline, whether it be mandated by a government or uh, private investors, does it have the right business plan? And does it come from a sound economical base? Because, you know, that's where the challenge is always. You'll find that particularly the two gentlemen at the end, you know, they have to come at the mandate that's been put in front of them to operate the business, but that mandate is always driven by certain external factors. And whether those are commercial factors, government factors, <clears throat> other pressures, uh, environmental issues, all of those aspects have to be taken into account before you start looking at the strategy. So I, I don't think that uh, in operators take enough time to spend within before they start spending time on looking for financing, looking for leases, looking for the right type of aircraft, looking at the right type of uh, uh, route plan before they actually get into seeking capital. Well, it's interesting that you say that because, you know, we, we could either have a confirmation or a rebuttal of some of that in terms of where, where governments stand on this because we've got Joao just down there on the end. Joao, how true is that? Uh, you know, how much of it is actually the, the airline strategy beholden to the dictates of the shareholder, or how much is, uh, is the shareholder view driven by the experts at the airline? Well, um, good morning, thank you very much. Uh, you know, uh, I've, w when we started discussing about this matter of finance and access to finance and the strategy in the airline, uh, I, I, it came to me African Airlines, and I, I think I've said this a few times, we are not African Airlines, we are airlines, international airlines, and some are run very well, and we have examples here, and I won't mention names, but, and then some are not so good examples that give a bad name to the rest. So I think the first step we have, and that's where we probably need help, is upstream, you know, with uh, government interference, government, uh, you know, very, very clear rules, uh, a proper, yeah, proper access to capital. We compete with airlines that get capital at 2%, and we pay 16%, for example. Uh, so there's no ways we can have a, a, an advantage there. 
uh, you know, when it comes to competing. Where, where what we need to stop is really, you know, this lack of efficiency, lack of ethics, uh, you know, and other issues that I think affect those uh, bad airlines or badly run uh, airlines, because the market is there. I mean, in Africa, we have market, we have people that need, want to fly, have, but have no, no buying power. And, and we have uh, uh, raw material, we have the, probably the next biggest challenge in, in the world of aviation is going to be manpower, pilots, technicians, operations specialists. We have people here that want to work, that need to work, and that can learn very quickly. Uh, that's been our experience. I mean, I've lived in Ethiopia for 10 years and I've seen what the changes were made there based on people uh, that they had there. So I believe that that's what, you know, that's the biggest strategy is to uh, capitalize on that, uh, that uh, you know, raw material we have, on the markets we have, and, and create volume. I think that's, I'm sorry, I'm going to one of the questions that you have, but we need volume. One of the biggest problems we have in some routes is that we fly three times a week to a destination where we could, with the same infrastructure, same people, we could do 30 flights a week and spread that cost around. So, so in, in very few words, what I'd like to say is that uh, the shareholder, in the case of uh, the airline I'm running, uh, has been has changed, has, has been changing a lot in terms of giving us some strategy, some rules, very clear, and that's what I've been asking for. No interference on a, on a day-to-day -day run, you know, but clarity, what do we want? For example, we have destinations in Africa, and I, I recall the uh, liberalization in, in America in the late 80s, early 90s. There were destinations that the governments were supporting. They were paying mm -hmm. for uh, airlines to serve those destinations because they were socially, politically, economically essential. And, and that's a cost. And, and I mean, I, uh, I won't say much, but we are working on it. We're saying, okay, we want to fly, we have to fly to those destinations. We did that during COVID. It costs so much. So as a customer, the government comes to us and say, yeah, here is a contract and we'll provide that kind of service. Also, I mean, taxes is not a problem to solve inefficiencies. We, we are seeing some, some destinations, some countries that you know, are raising taxes, flight permits by so much that it will Im impair the, the, the flexibility of connectivity. Uh, and to finish, uh, not to extend too much, the other thing, and I, I have to talk about SATAM. I mean, in Africa we have SATAM, but we, we also have 50 degree freedoms for big operators that are not in Africa. Mm -hmm. you know, and I, I always say, you know, let's do it. But, you know, fairly, it has to benefit all the key players, all the fair players that are there and not, you know, just ones. Because, I mean, I can do a flight to, to Joburg. I mean, let's say I'm an operator in West Africa. I do Joburg, Maputo, back to my, destiny, my origin. And it might be cheaper for me because fuel is cheaper or because it's low altitude. I can carry more, more passengers. And then I can dump the fares to kill an mm -hmm. operator that's established in the route, like we are, for example. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to extend much more, but this is my thought about it. Thank you know, you. there's so much insight you've gone through. I think you've taken up about half my, uh, my potential talking points, but we'll get others <laughs> to come back to this. But the one that I actually grabbed and wrote a note on is where you mentioned, you know, the, the comparative rates that uh, African airlines have to pay for debt, where you mentioned that, you know, the global debt average tends to be around 2% while African airlines tend to get stuck, I mean, you said 16%, and I think that's a very favorable rate you get because you're a government-owned airline. And I mean, uh, I know the private sector, 16% for an African startup airline would be, would be a, a pipe dream. So I'm gonna throw this to our banker on the panel, Helen. Tell me, why is capital, access to capital, so difficult and so expensive in Africa? Thank you, Sean. Uh, I'd just like to spend one or two minutes talking about Africa Bank. Uh, Africa Bank is primarily a trade finance bank, and our core mandate is to promote the development of intra-African trade. Uh, but in doing that, we recognize that we need to also support the underlying trade enabling infrastructure to achieve the benefits of our core mandate. And obviously we recognize that the aviation sector uh, is one of those underlying uh, foundations. So, so speaking directly to your question, I would say the primary, one of the first reasons why uh, airline companies don't have access to the same competitive rates as their competitors is the fact that they're not profitable. Um, if you look at the average African airline, um, they lose a dollar and 50 cents for every passenger that they carry 
compared to the global average of $7.80 profit. So they're actually in the red. And, and what, what are the reasons for that? I mean, it has to do with their high cost of operations. Uh, fuel costs, as we know, contributes about 35% of your operating costs, and it's 20% uh, higher than their peers. So that has significant implications uh, on, on, on that. And I think the other issue is the, is the perception of risk. I mean, if you talk to an international financer, an international leasing company, um, the perception of risk for Africa is very high. And the, the, the thing about the aviation sector is that it's, it's very capital intensive. And most of that capital is not within the continent. It's coming from outside the continent. And you know, when you talk to some of these companies, it's not just a perception of risk, they've actually seen that risk crystallize. And because they've seen it crystallize, they tend to uh, demand a premium for that. And that premium essentially dovetails into the cost of, of, of funding. So, so in terms of what, of what we can do differently, and I think that speaks to a lot of things that have already been said over the last couple of days is, uh, we need to work uh, jointly, and I believe collaboration is key uh, to creating uh, an environment that can attract this capital. Uh, but I think more importantly, we need to start to think about, and then this is Africa as a continent, uh, creating our own sources of capital, our own pool of capital that understands uh, the risk of Africa and can, will not unduly punish airlines for this risk perception. And I think uh, sometime during the conference, I will talk about some of the things Africa Zim Bank is doing uh, to help uh, uh, African airlines in accessing capital. No, and you're absolutely right. I think, you know, as you say, there's a, it's an issue of perception because while you say an African airline on average uh, loses money, there are African airlines which don't. And uh, one of them is sitting right next to you. And, you know, he's, he's survived this many years in the industry quite simply because he was being profitable. So, Roger, what are your views on this? You know, do you also find that potentially, say, your expansion plans now that you've gone independent with Airlink, uh, are those being constrained by lack of access to capital or the rates that capital is being offered? Or, yeah, I think capital is uh, is an interesting topic. Um, you know, obviously, airlines rely on liquidity, and liquidity follows on from equity, and equity follows on from profitability, and profitability comes with sustainability. And it goes about the bigger picture of Africa, and Helen has identified that Africa is a place where um, there are a number of airlines. Um, the history of airline success in Africa is extremely poor, and I think if one considers the history at the local and sub-regional level, um, I would liken it to a failed industry without pulling the punches. And when one talks about access to capital of an industry that has a history of failure, um, then the risk premium associated with the capital uh, is serious. And I think that's one of the challenges that, that we have. Um, the other one is that we have an overtraded continent, fundamentally, and I know that we've heard you know, the other side of it being, gee whiz, we've got this huge continent and what a wonderful opportunity for air transportation. We've got 18% of the world's population, but hey, we've got 300 airlines. Yet China's got 10 and it's got the same size of population and India's got about the same number, it's got about the same size of population. How do we as a continent sustain 300 airlines? That's absurd and I think there are some fundamental and structural issues that as a continent, as an industry, we need to get to grips with. We talk about consolidation, we talk about collaboration, we talk about SATAM, single African air transportation market, liberalizing. But at the end of the day, there are too many players and too much capacity for Africa to really get mobilized with air access. So going back to the question, and you know, I'd like to say, you talk about a successful airline and a profitable airline. Well, I don't think that there's any airline in Africa, with respect, uh, not even some of my colleagues in the room here. <laughs> they may differ in opinion, but, you know, we've been through the COVID pandemic. We've seen the lights being switched off. We've seen airlines trying to rebuild uh, their business piece by piece uh, in a market which hasn't returned yet to pre-COVID. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult to find uh, survivability, let alone success. So for me, 
uh, when you talk about success and profitability, I think that will come in due course. The success in the short term is, heck, those guys that have survived so far have, have done a miraculous job of navigating their way through the fiercest black swan events all cocktailed together in the most unprecedented storm ever for air transportation. And um, I, I just think that Africa is an opportunity, but we need to get to grips with the thinness of the markets. You know, we talk about 2% of air transportation is vested in Africa, global air transportation. Is there a correlation between the 2% of air transportation that is vested in Africa and the size of the collective African economy, representing less than 2% of the global economy? Yes, they're 18% of the people, and Africa's a big continent, and they're 55, sometimes 56. I never know what the metric is. Is it 57? Is it 54 countries in Africa? But, you know, we've got to really try and find a way to unite the industry, and it goes about the regulatory framework and all kinds of other things. It goes about the rationalization of the number of players and then the appropriate deployment of capital to markets, recognizing that the markets are actually quite thin. Fundamentally, we've got some strong markets, like between Johannesburg and Cape Town, uh, the 10th busy, busy or the 11th busiest city pair in the world. We understand that, but most of the markets intra-Africa are actually thin little markets, and we need to get to grips with that reality. Thank you. Now, I think you, you've raised some, well, a lot of points that a lot of people here could, could, could learn from. Um, but, you know, the interesting thing you say is that it's some, a lot of these markets are cyclical, they're unpredictable, they, they're thin. But there also are times where some of these markets have surges. And one of the things that, that some airlines have done in the past to, to deal with that has been utilizing ACMIs and wet leases and so forth. So I throw this to Federico here from an ACMI specialist provider in terms of what do you think? Do you think that African airlines have not used ACMI enough? Have they used it too much? Have they used it as a crutch in some markets to get around safety concerns? Where do you see the ACMI industry internally in Africa as well as providing to Africa in the current uh, scenario? Well, I think, uh, I, Sean, and good morning to everyone. And uh, I think wet lease for sure is an option. I wouldn't say it's the best option because, I mean, that would be too easy to say it's the best option to solve all the, all the problems. But it's still an option uh, on the market. And uh, as, a, as a wet lease company, um, we can look on, uh, on the difference between Europe and Africa. That, for example, in terms of seasonal, uh, seasonality, where, for example, we have our seasonality, here is low seasonability. So we could uh, take advantage of when our low productivity um, comes, comes on, and we could lease units because we see an option in this market, um, as, I say, as I said, an option to recover such market and help um, African airlines. So um, definitely I see uh, a good option for, uh, for them. Um, during uh, the, their peak period, uh, where at lower market rate, uh, we could recover some of our internal fixed costs, because at the end, fixed costs is what it comes in terms of uh, uh, profitability and, uh, and numbers, numbers and, uh, and so on. So, we recover some of the fixed costs, and at the same time, we can give a good product to this market uh, during those months of prof profitability for a peak season, uh, where they can make good revenue and at a lower mar market rate. So, uh, I think still is not uh, um, the African Airlines didn't uh, consider much such options. So. That's why we are here, that's why we could uh, explore, that's why uh, we're happy to sit down and uh, it was a pleasure to, yesterday to, to sit down with many, many airlines, exploring this opportunity and see how we can help them uh, to recover from, uh, from uh, this situation. Yeah, I think that's, that's great. And you know, I'm going to throw this now at Joao because he's an African airline who has in the past used wet lease ACMI capacity. You know, he's got a fleet that's primarily geared towards medium and uh, regional aircraft but they've run seasonal ACMI leases for long-haul flights. And how's your experience been with that? Uh, the experience has been very positive because, uh, you know, being a, such a small airline and uh, in the recovery process that we had, uh, first of all, access to equipment is difficult. Our balance sheet has not been clean yet. 
So ACMI was very convenient to get a, a low price aircraft, uh, low relatively low cost, and for a specific period. And, and by the way, with COVID, it was very convenient because we were able to cut when demand was, was low. So in general, you know, ACMIs, we come to South Africa for a lot of them. We open new routes using some ACMI aircraft. And in the case of the long haul, we went to an operator in the destination we were flying to, which was Lisbon, and was a very good partnership. Uh, it worked very well. It proved the route. It showed that the route could be profitable. And I think it will show once the COVID is over and, and the restrictions are out, perhaps the government will be uh, interested in investing in that uh, route, which is so profitable uh, for us. No, and you know that's, that brings me to another point where you're talking about that sometimes these are very expensive, long-haul aircraft are expensive to acquire, expensive to operate. And I think a reason for that, and, well, the question's going to go to Samir here, is how important is the Cape Town Convention? Since we're in Cape Town, we can't not bring that up. Uh, how important is the Cape Town Convention for a lessor when, uh, when examining whether they want to place an aircraft into a specific country or not? Sure. I mean, from our perspective, <clears throat> it's typically the, one of the top two or three risk items we look at immediately when uh, assessing an opportunity. A new inquiry will come in, and we've got a, a request to lease an aircraft in jurisdiction X or Y. And our first question is not about the strength of the business plan, although that's what's going to drive our decision. Our first concern is, what is the asset risk, and how are we going to repossess that asset in the event, <coughs> oh, there we go. In the event that everything goes wrong? Because that's what we all have to plan for, right? Is assuming that uh, uh, the business plan doesn't work, another COVID happens, uh, or any other factors in between. And the reality is that a lot of countries, uh, and it's not just Africa, there's a lot of countries who are still struggling with the concept of, of supporting their own aviation industry by ratifying the Cape Town Convention. That's on its own. If we're talking about cost, that is actually has a, a direct price impact into the lease rate. So for any of the operators, the next time you're looking for a lease or even financing and you are trying to understand why there's such a premium or why the cost of funding is so expensive, it's because your jurisdiction has not ratified Cape Town. It's specifically built in there to add extra cost. So you know, the Cape Town is one part of it. I go back to my first point, the business plan is another aspect because you have to anticipate those issues, you know, one of them being uh, how are the lessors and financiers going to uh, mitigate their financial risks? How are they going to deal with uh, any of the environmental or socioeconomic issues that affect the plausibility of that business plan? Has it been validated well enough? And I think those are key issues that have to all come together towards make sure that the commercial plan has been well anticipated and is sustainable. Like back to, again, the points that Joanne and Roger have made. No, and you, you're absolutely right. You know, the, the perception of what is actually... Roger raised this thing, which has got me thinking a bit more, and, you know, what actually is success in Africa? And, uh, you know, I think too many African airlines have tended to define success as flying half-empty, brand-new white bodies to London, Dubai, and Paris for prestige, rather than focusing on, uh, you know, profitable routes. And that's, had, that's traditionally been more... Uh, focus of ego-driven vanity projects. That's one of my favorite phrases. But, you know, some airlines have, have chosen to focus on their niches and have, well, have had to compete with these ego-driven vanity projects uh, directly and indirectly, as especially in a private sector uh, operator, that brings its own set of challenges. And Roger, how is your experience in terms of competing both in your domestic market as well as in the regional market where you're head-to-head -head with a number of national champions, so to speak. Um, you know, how, how does the current framework of uh, half-heartedly implemented so-called SATAM uh, work for you competitively? Well, I think let's first address uh, your question, Sean, about national flag carriers flying the national flag on the tails of an aircraft to key destinations like London Heathrow, for example, or Charles de Gaulle or, or Frankfurt. Um, I think that notion is a, is a fallacy. Um, I think if there is a national interest to advertise uh, the tourism potential and the opportunities that are vested within a country, um, well then, heck, buy the weather spot on Sky TV or CNN. Firstly, it's a hell of a lot cheaper, and secondly, you're going to get bang for buck because you don't get bang for buck 
by parking your tail at London Heathrow Airport. Who sees it and who cares? So um, I think that's, that's the first point. The second one is um, how do we compete with our national carrier um, and the other national carriers? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, to, to be frank, we, we firstly like competition. Um, and secondly, we, we value the competition that we have from certain of the national carriers in the sub-region. Um, you know, competition at the end of the day is also about performance, and performance is what you do within your operation to deliver the best potential that you have within your organization. So part of our objective is be the best we can, be the best version of us that we can be. And let's not really worry about the competition. Um, the competition will worry about themselves. You know, our mission is to be the best from an on-time performance point of view, but service delivery is not just about on-time performance. It's about um, creating a wonderful experience from a customer point of view, but such that the customer will actually remember that experience and come back to us again. And it, it goes beyond that as well, because you know, we have to think about who we are and what we are and what we do. Um, and we've done that soul searching uh, since we parted ways with the national carrier where we'd had a relationship for you know, some 27 years odd. And um, it's given us the opportunity to identify exactly what we do, which I think is important. We spoke earlier on about strategy. What is our strategy? We have a strategy. Uh, part of the strategy is to be the most comprehensive airline network system, not to be the biggest and not even to be the best but to be the best version of us that we can be. And part of it is the network. The, the reason why the network is because, on the one hand, our peers are often the point-to-point -point carriers. And we must be able to compete with our peers, both from a cost perspective and also on the revenues that are normally predicated by our competitors. Um, and we also have to carry, so in other words, we have to be a point-to-point -point service provider. We also have to be a low-cost carrier because if we're not in the cost market, then we're not in the game. So we have to be there too. And what we've really focused on is the importance, the relevance of a strong, rich, dense network system so that we can carry passengers from the source markets within our network to the destinations within our network, but also so that we can leverage off our network and use the network of our global partners. Um, I think uh, the audience would be aware that just recently we were fortunate enough to be able to sign up with Qatar on a code share. We've had a long-standing relationship with Qatar, and we're delighted that we've signed a code share with Qatar. Qatar is, by Skytrax measure, the best airline in the world, and they've got the best airport in the world as well, with Hamad International Airport. And to have the ability to be able to marry the Qatar network with that of our network is such a big bonus from a customer perspective. Uh, and that's really what it's about. So, you know, we wish Jar well. He actually traveled to Cape Town on Airlink. Well, at least between Maputo and Johannesburg. Um, so at the end of the day, he might be a competitor, but he's also a customer. And uh, he very graciously turned around. He said, I actually enjoyed the flight. It was quite, quite nice. So, you know, that's great. We, we, we neighbors, um, we need to work together because sometimes when we drop the ball, we look at Zhao and Lam and we say, Zhao, you know, please let's, um, you know, make sure that you've got uh, reprotection, but please can you look after our customers and vice versa. Um, and, you know, we've concentrated on dispatch reliability. We focused on on-time performance. It goes about what the customer wants. And we love the competition that we have from Lam because it's friendly. We don't always like our competitors, some are not so friendly, but at the end of the day, you know, we have to perform. Competition makes you perform. And yeah, I think that's, that sums it up very, very well. Um, which, you, know, you, you mentioned a lot about, I wouldn't say necessarily being everything to everybody, but as you said, you've got to be able to serve your market, and that's, you know, you, you, you've basically got an airline of regional aircraft. You, you're ranging from the really small, which you use for your lodge links, up to the you know, jet streams, Embraer 135s, 140s, and now the, you know, the e-jets. Definitely there are markets, and there are times in these markets, again, when you need extra capacities. Um, wet lease operators, 
do you look at these voids in, in markets? Like, you know, South Africa has a void right now. Everybody is rushing to fill it the best they can with the assets they have. Is that something that you guys are, are waiting for, that you look for, that you seek to target? Ooh. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay. I think you can continue, huh? No, because the camera's got to come back. They're recording oh, the it camera. for the uh, oh, sorry. Okay. YouTube, yeah. the live, the uh, YouTube yeah. next week. If you if you want to heckle us, this is the time to do it because it won't be captured on camera. Can I start with the first heckle? You can start with the first heckle. Somebody wanted to I throw oranges at us. I can't remember who it was. Are you here? <laughs> I think the power outage was divine intervention of this void in South Africa. You talk well, about. Well, there you go. You know? We're talking about. Uh, <laughs> Maybe it's more of a rationalization of the market than there it is a go. void. Now, when we're talking about voids in South Africa mm -hmm. and uh, the business environment, you know, there's one in aviation, there's definitely one in the power sector, but we're not, we're not discussing the power sector. How, how do you guys see that? Do you see that you are potentially a solution that can be, you know, a turnkey solution that can be provided? Do you go to Roger and say, Roger, you, you need to increase your capacity, Johannesburg, Cape Town. Uh, the opportunity is now. Here's some A321s nice and cheap, uh, make it work. Well, I, I think it's important not to close any sort of windows in terms of opportunities. When we go um, on the market, we would like to talk with as many airlines as possible in order to see what is their opinion in terms of wet trees capacity. If we see um, an opportunity, we are always happy as far, of course, first regulation, first safety, first approvals, so there are a lot of aspects behind the wet list that has to be considered. And um, as far for both parties, it's a win-win project. We, why not? Um, an airline wants to um, increase capacity on a certain route and try the aspect uh, with a wet list. Um, let's go for it. Uh, or um, any other opportunity, yeah, why not? I mean. Uh, why, why shall we close such, uh, such windows? And I'm Absolutely. I think uh, you, know, you, you go where your opportunity presents itself. You can't not do that. I'm going to throw a question to you, Helen, because again, part of this discussion has tended to veer upon government-backed versus private sector. Do you really see a difference in risk profile? You spoke about you know, high risk in Africa, but do you see a higher risk for... Do you see government-backed entities as higher risk or lower risk in general? Well, we don't necessarily see them as higher risk um, because we welcome the fact that some airlines require support. Uh, they require support from the government. Uh, what we like to see is what is your strategy, um, both long term and short term. And we like to see a clear delineation. I mean, it's one thing to be providing financial support, but when it comes to the actual operations and running of the airline. We like to see that the management is in charge and capable of making economic decisions that actually influence the viability of the airline without unnecessarily um, um, being subject to political interference. Uh, uh, that being said, uh, from an Afrexim perspective, uh, Afrexim has uh, easily mobilized over $2 billion uh, to support the aviation sector uh, in, in Africa. And, and we do that from a variety of instruments. We provide senior debt, we provide junior debt. Uh, we also provide financing to support uh, uh, PDPs. Uh, well, last year, we opened a new subsidiary, uh, which will also be able to invest equity uh, in, in, in some of these companies. And another thing that we do uh, quite strongly, uh, we definitely believe that the future of aviation uh, is closely linked to the successful implementation of the AFC-FTA. And we're a strong advocate of that. Uh, we believe that uh, even just getting countries to sign up uh, for the SAATM uh, is gonna be very critical uh, to the success of the AFC-FTA. Uh, so we're using our voice to create some level of advocacy in helping create um, more enabling environments to attract uh, capital. Uh, one of the things we're also considering, and uh, I mean, we're still running a lot of studies, um, but I talked about earlier about how Africa can actually create the required pool of capital 
uh, within Africa to support uh, Africa Airlines. And one of the things African Bank uh, is considering is setting up uh, an aviation uh, leasing platform. And the aviation leasing platform will hopefully offer uh, better solutions, better alternatives um, in terms of access to cheaper uh, uh, leasing uh, options uh, to the local airlines. Uh, and I think this will go a long way to supporting uh, a lot of the local players because, I mean, we've been in operations for almost 30 years now. We understand uh, the African market. We understand the risk that involved. And, and our approach to analyzing and differentiating the risk is, is very different um, from what your typical providers of capital uh, would, approach, would, would embrace. Thank you. That is a very good note there, where I'm now going to ask Mala if she can put up the results of the poll from our audience now, which uh, would then give us about five or six minutes to have a discussion whether we agree or disagree or whether we choose E option like Samir had, none of the above. Let's see how we're doing. Oh, okay, sorry. All right, then we'll, we'll, we'll keep chatting on something else. I, I had another little one here, which is a bit of a, a shit bomb to throw in here. So this question is going to go to Samir, because he's a former OEM as well as a lessor. And this question is, I've been, I've been an operator in Africa all over the place, and constantly when lessors and OEMs come to me and, you know, I've got a product they're trying to flog to me, they, they over-promise and under-deliver. And, you know, I've, I've seen plenty of, 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 oh, you could use this aircraft to fly to London and be profitable because the market's going to grow X amount. Do you believe that lessors and OEMs have an obligation to be transparent and truthful about market data and operating costs to African customers? Or because it's Africa, all's just fair in business? <laughs> I like the question. <clears throat> Look, uh, first of all, I've never overpromised and underdelivered. It's the other way around. Um, but no, you know, at the end of the day, you're right. You know, if we go back to the previous last two questions, and we talk about how does government support uh, actually help or entice the, the transactions to move forward and the opportunity for the airlines to grow, I think ultimately, as an OEM, and I, I go back to my OEM hat, not specifically any particular. OEM brand, but as an OEM, your objective is different than what a lessor's objective is. And it is, unfortunately, sometimes not necessarily aligned with what the airline's objective is, whether it's implied or they even know it. The reality is, as an OEM, you're going to look at and assess the market, where the potential is. You're going to try and create that view, that long-term plan, particularly when you're focusing on new aircraft sales because of the higher price targets is really to show where the viability of that plan is. And I think that from a market perspective, sometimes there's a resistance to listening to what the OEM has to say because, you know, there's a preconceived notion is I need to have this kind of wide body to fly from this particular point of origin to London. That's my mandate. And, and you kind of look at it and shake your head and say, how do you fit a business plan? I mean, just talking about what both Roger and Joao talked about. How do you create a plan that's sustainable to say, I need to put this wide body on this trunk route and then build an airline around that? And the reality, I think, has come really to light uh, because of the pandemic. And, and interestingly enough, let's talk about Europe before we talk about Africa. There was a, such a large or a significant move from smaller narrow bodies to larger narrow bodies, and, and, and nothing against one OEM or the other, but I'll just pick the A319 to 320 to 321 and 321 XLR progression. Everybody was moving and racing towards 321s because you know, you've got challenges at Heathrow with slots, you've got challenges at Frankfurt, you've, you've got to start getting away from smaller markets. Austrian is moving out of uh, small markets where they were bringing traffic from regional aircraft into into the wider air body aircraft. But the minute something like the pandemic happens, the first thing they do is revert back to the regional fleet. That's where the money is being made. That's where the profitability is. That's where the infrastructure costs are better managed, rather than trying to fill that wide body to London. It, it doesn't make any sense. It comes back to the same thing here, is, is the OEMs and, and lessors to a certain capacity will share the costs that we have. But on the other side, there has to be a discussion to understand those costs, understand what are the, the parameters around that has built, been built, and then challenge those. And if the, you don't challenge those, and you just accept that plan, say, look, OEMX convinced me this plan, and in 10 years we can do this, now I need a sovereign guarantee to back the lease, to back the purchase. It, the, the whole project has failed from the beginning. So I think that ultimately, 
yeah, there is a responsibility, there's an ethical aspect, but it's also equally, if not more so, on the receiving end, because they've got to be able to understand what's been put in front of them, accept it, and then the most important part is implement it, because the reality is that's where their failure happens. They, they accept a, a great plan that's been stamped by an OEM, but they don't know how to roll it out. Absolutely. Right. Now I think uh, yeah, there's a, a few truths for a few people in this room to take back with them. Uh, now we've got the poll results now, so uh, I don't think there's much surprise here. I can see Roger stifling a smile over there that <laughs> most of the room seems to think that anti-competitive activity by government players is, uh, well, is the most critical financial issue facing African airlines today. So I'm going to throw this at you, Roger. What is your plan to counter this? How are you going to survive the anti-competitive activity? You're now going to be head-to-head -head with the government-owned airline, and uh, both in, in the courtroom and in the uh, court of public opinion. What's your strategy? Well, I think I've already said it, and that is we just have to do the best we can to be the best version of ourselves we can, and that entails outperforming. Um, I, I think government entities, government state-owned state enterprise, airline businesses um, also have to preserve their credibility and their integrity. And uh, it's one of the things that um, is right on top of our own internal value system is to make sure that our integrity is intact at all times and our credibility is intact. And that doesn't just go about um, our suppliers and service providers, including fuel, which is you know, the biggest consumable within uh, an airline business today. Um, it's, it's about convincing uh, internally to the organization, organically, uh, of the integrity of the business and our entire supply value chain about who we are and what we are. And on the basis of those things, you know, when, when we take a look at, for example, on-time performance as one of the metrics, and we consistently right up on top or within the top two, neck and neck with our peers in the business, Fly Safe, I'm happy to say that we're ahead of them at the moment and we have been for the last two and a half years. Um, it's, it's, about, it's about performance, so bring on the state-owned enterprise competitors and if they do perform anything which is antitrust, um, there is a watchdog and we'll go to them. As we've done in one of the neighboring states, and I'm very happy to say that we've got a ruling in our favor against a national carrier. Uh, unfortunately, that national carrier went bust in the process and they're not there at the moment for us to go and recover some money from. Um, but that's incidental. You know, we're not scared of taking them on, both in the field, in competition directly head on. We know we can outperform them. And if there is anything that is antitrust behavior, we will be very, very quick on our feet to make sure that justice is done. Thank you. Absolutely. I think you've summed it up well. And, you know, from a personal perspective, I think you're absolutely right. When I was choosing my flights to travel from Johannesburg to Cape Town, uh, in the end, I, I flew down on Safair, and I'm flying back with you all tomorrow. And uh, I was fortunate I did not book on the government carrier because my colleagues who did were two and a half hours delayed. So uh, with that, I'm going to see, John, do you have any questions from, uh, from the audience now? We seem to be OK on this. We're running a bit late, I think. And uh, so with, with, your, with your permission, I will thank the panel no, for no. their wonderful <laughs> contributions and time. No, really, thank you all for being a wonderful audience and not throwing oranges at us. And uh, you know, we'll move on now to the to the final bits of the day, which will be the uh, the award presentations, where John will be emceeing for us. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.